What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 161. Today, we are going to be doing something a little different than we normally do on our show, but we're really excited for this episode because this is something that a lot of people don't know about, at least yeah. here in the U.S. And for I don't sure. want to offend people. People are always like, oh, don't say Americans are stupid. I'm not saying Americans are stupid or uninformed or that anyone here watching is uninformed, but we didn't know about this. This is not something I had heard about because a lot of the times we don't get a lot of international news here. Our news cycle is very much so just about our country a lot of the time. And yeah. this is something that I just completely missed. And Janelle didn't know about it. You didn't know about it. No, I didn't know at all. I was shocked because this only happened like two years ago. Yeah. So. And it's crazy that this, uh, it's just, I think more people need to hear this story and I heard about it actually on TikTok. I was just scrolling, you know, doing some toilet scrolling. And then I came across um, Stephanie, who is a survivor of the White Island volcano disaster, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And she is absolutely incredible and so inspirational. And I spent probably an hour just scrolling through her TikTok, and then I had to look into it more. Yeah. And I found this kind of documentary on it, like a news special, and showed it to Josh. And we were just blown away. Blew my mind. I mean, this is literally probably one of the scariest things that could happen to you as a human mm -hmm. on this planet. I mean, when you go toe to toe with mother nature, I mean, sometimes it can end really, really badly. And what was just so True. crazy about this event, and honestly, I personally think that there's probably some sort of crime involved with what happened uh, to these poor people that happened to be on a tourist like excursion yep. from a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. And they somehow ended up on one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's actually New Zealand's most active volcano and things just went horribly wrong. And we'll get into all of that obviously in this episode, but it, when, when I heard her story and just like saw some of the footage, it just, blew my mind that there's actually people I on this island when this volcano went off. It's truly not something I've ever thought about happening, I guess, because you don't no. often hear well, we don't really story, live especially like, on excursions like this. Yeah. You know, so many of us go on vacations and go on these excursions and you always feel like you're so safe on them yeah, for some reason. Yeah. Like there's this element of I'm fine because yeah. I'm on vacation and right. well plus you, you, know? you I feel like you're like, oh well if it was dangerous they wouldn't offer this to me right. and to their tourists Somebody's or looking out to their for us, cruise right? line goers or what you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. Of course it's safe. Otherwise we wouldn't be here. It'd be closed. Like Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, what that's, you'd hope. And that's kind of what That's why I think there's a crime yeah. that I mean there's negligence here, major criminal negligence in my opinion that's yeah. going on here. And And beyond just that, things yeah. that we will get into. So much crazy shit with yeah, this one. It's really something that more people need to know about and hear the aftermath of like maybe you had heard about it at the time when it happened, the explosion, but maybe you haven't heard the updates of what has happened since and what the people who are there have been through because it's it is just unbelievable before we dive into this story though we do ha still have some merch available from our 420 collection we on our website malharmerch.com just want to throw it out there there's still stuff mm -hmm. stuff available we did a couple restocks on some items so mm -hmm. if you haven't checked out our latest collection definitely do because there's some good stuff on there lots of 420 accessories yes there is use all year not just on 420 <laughs> yes there is before we get into today's story though we do have an exciting announcement to make in regards to higher level wellness. We do. I'm really excited about this. We are launching a new flavor of our tincture in Blueberry OG. And this has been very requested by you guys who have tried our Blueberry Wax and have really liked the flavor of it. So we wanted to do something similar in tincture form. Yeah. And by flavor, we're talking about the terpene profile, right? Yes. So Blueberry OG is a terpene blend and basically there's actually a cannabis strain called blueberry og or blueberry og kush and it's actually an indica dominant strain so this this tincture is going to have you know tones of blueberry uh which actually goes very well with an oil so you can actually you know mm -hmm. taste good but it's also a great thing to mix into drinks and food and anything else you want to yeah essentially take it with and it's actually very good for kind of end of the day type of feel mm -hmm. it's very calming it's very soothing um, and just kind of give you, you know, that overall, you know, chill out feeling. So this tincture is vegan. It's THC free. It comes in 500 and a thousand milligrams in broad spectrum CBD. So 
absolutely free of THC, which is great. Won't show up yep. any drug tests or anything like that. Yep. And you get that entourage effect of all yep. the other uh, cannabinoids. So it's, it's You're not really, really psychoactive. good. Psychoactive anything from it so yeah it's really good stuff the blueberry og tincture will be available on our website harlovewellness.com on may 19th at and, midnight yes and it is limited batch so mm -hmm. you know if you want to try it definitely get on the site as soon as you can as soon as the clock strikes 12 <laughs> on may 19th um that's when you should definitely hop on and get try it out yeah, I'm really excited to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Because well, the Pineapple Express has been so popular with it's people so that good. we had to do more fruit flavors because it just honestly, you know, the fruity CBD ones are so good. Taste so good. Yeah, yeah I, I love it, especially when you use terpenes because they're natural. It just goes. It, it's just so and good. the terpenes have their own benefits to it, too, which is mm -hmm. cool. So if you look up the Blueberry OG terpene blend, you can actually look at what the different terpenes do. If you want to yeah. get really scientific with it, it's actually really cool stuff. There's it is. A lot of evidence to back up what CBD can do for you. Yeah, and real quick, I just wanted to thank everyone who has purchased from our brand already. We appreciate all the support. We're, you know, we wouldn't be able to launch new products already if it wasn't for all the support we've gotten from you guys. So, thank you very, very much. You ready to get into? Yeah, things? let's go ahead and get into White Island though. So the White Island eruption it happened on an island called White Island, or it's actually known by its Maori name, Fakari. And it's New Zealand's most active volcano. And actually New Zealand just in general, I believe, I'm not a geologist by any means, but at one point, you know, there's a supercontinent and it broke off of, of a larger supercontinent. But a lot of the islands surrounding New Zealand mm. are formed by volcanoes. It's very volcanic. So it's not surprising to, you know, have some active volcanoes there. And the Fakari volcano is extremely active. It erupts uh, every few years, I believe. And it's actually located in the Bay of Plenty, which is about 30 miles from the country's northeast coast. And it rises more than a thousand feet above the surface, but most of the actual volcano itself, it's actually called a submarine volcano because it's all underwater, which is kind of honestly kind of eerie it to me is. to think about that. And it's hard to imagine too, because when you it is, yeah. like look at videos from out on the water, looking at it when it's right in front of you, it just looks so big already just to think that it's just the tip of it and mm -hmm. it's all underneath. It's yeah. kind of hard to even picture in your mind's eye, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I think there's just like this fascination with volcanoes in general. I mean, I've, I've always been fascinated by volcanoes. Ever since I saw Mount Doom from Lord of the Rings, I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. God. <laughs> what do you, what are you making fun of me about that? That's not like CGI. <laughs> My God. But if you think about, I mean, that. <laughs> jo okay, I have to say it. Josh just literally spent like 10 minutes before we started recording trying to convince me to watch all of the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> he said he's going to strap her down and make yeah. her watch them for She's 12 like, hours. Seriously, it should, be a, it should be a crime, especially. <laughs> Please. To watch. It's <laughs> one of the, it won 11 no. academy awards dude it's like i know josh we're not saying it's bad i have sat through it i did a 12-hour marathon for this guy because i love him in a movie theater like i couldn't even get away from it but i'm a know. big lord of the rings fan i have it's good it's several very good. lord of the rings tattoos <laughs> i am obsessed with it i have been since i was a young kid that's and why we really want to go to new zealand one day that's like top of our bucket it list. is when, it one is. day we're going and for all we know, we could have went on a White Island tour. I would have wanted to do something like that if I knew, you know, no. knew it was going to be safe. I yeah. would, but that that would have attracted cool. you to it for sure. Oh, yeah. of course, it's a volcano. I think everyone's got a natural interest in volcanoes, yeah. or even if you're scared of them, it's still fascinating. They're mm -hmm. just so well, un we, so foreign because you can't really go in one. And you definitely can't. I guess you can actually. You can we had looked up there's the that crater. one in yeah. Iceland where you can drop down to and I think it was one of the only ones in the world you can go inside an active volcano. I can't imagine going in it. Yeah. Um but yeah, the people on this were just going to the volcano just to like view it and well, they walk, walk around, around it. Yeah, it was like hike a it. walking tour of it. And it, so it's not you don't think it's going to be dangerous, right? No. Just no. oh, we're going to walk around. Well, cuz mm -hmm. like you assume historically volcanoes don't erupt like you know all the time you know right. it's not like they know every, it's not like it's the geyser in, in yellowstone mm -hmm. that they know like on on a clockwork yeah. when it's gonna you know go off it's but they can see the seismic activity they do they monitor check. they monitor the pressure and all these different things you so you'd know, assume, of the volcano. you know if those levels are raised that no one would be you know even allowed to go there that's mm -hmm. just what you'd assume yeah well there's but you'd assume wrong yeah yeah, you do Sad. assume wrong. 
but I mean, it does. It makes sense to me why people want to check out volcanoes. I mean, we were just in Hawaii like a year or two ago, and we went to the big island of Hawaii where there's an active volcano there. And I didn't think we stayed like at the base of it, and I didn't think anything of it. We drove to the top of it yeah. where they have the observatory up there and stuff. Yep. And it's technically, I believe that one's, well, actually, I don't know if that one is still active and it hasn't erupted in a very long time. But, you know, you just assume that, you know, the likeliness of, of a volcanic eruption while you're on the volcano is mm-hmm. very slim to none. Mm-hmm. And you just expect people to be monitoring it and to let you know to close it off if it's unsafe. But in this particular case with the Fakari volcano, this was extremely active. In fact, um, it has erupted over the last several decades. It actually erupts very frequently, but it hasn't stopped people from wanting to go to the island and from tourist companies, you know, setting up excursions there. In fact, since the early 1990s, hundreds of thousands of people have stepped foot onto this active volcano. In fact, more than 18,000 people come to it each year. So once you arrive on the island, you have to boat out there. And once you arrive on it, you get to take a hike to the caldera, which is the large volcanic crater, which is like the highlight of the tour. And the caldera is formed after a large eruption and the magma chamber beneath the volcano empties and it collapses in on itself, creating the crater. So if you look at actual Mm -hmm. aerial views of this volcano, you can see the massive crater uh, that it has there in the middle uh, of its peak. And that is White Island in this photo? It is. I wonder if they call it White Island because it's It's white. white. It is, yeah. Okay, so they do. Yeah, it's got a white consistency to it. It's actually shaped like an amphitheater. It's very beautiful. It is, it's gorgeous. Then you have the blue water all around it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really a... A sight to see honestly but after an old sulfur mine on the island closed in the 1930s it was completely abandoned for decades until it found new life mm-hmm. as a tourist attraction and tourism new zealand promoted white island to australian travel agents as adventure tourism and it's one of new zealand's hidden gems and the island has become so popular that multiple tour groups were brought there daily by boat and helicopter Mm-hmm. On those big tour boats where they have two decks and like a ferry a ton almost of people. type yeah. of, of boat. But then the ferry doesn't actually, you can't actually like dock on the island itself. You actually have to take smaller like blow up inflatable boats mm-hmm. to get to the shore. I mean, it's very remote, very hard to get to. So these wide island tours became a very important part of Fakatani, which is the town east of the Bay of Plenty. And it's a perfect combination of small town charm with plenty of activities for tourists. And in 2017, Fakatani's biggest Maori tribe bought White Island tours, which brought tourists to White Island boats. And the tribe used compensation provided by the state for colonial theft of their land. And the tours were very important to the local economy there and to the Maori people who live there, who make up 43.5% of the town's population. So on December 4th, 2019, the Royal Caribbean cruise ship Ovation of the Seas set sail from Sydney for New Zealand for a 12-day cruise. 12 and days, oh. That sounds nice. nice. It's beautiful. Australia's beautiful, oh, New Zealand's beautiful. Yeah, New Zealand Who wouldn't want to go on a cruise? Of course, right? yeah. And Royal Caribbean, we all have heard of it. I mean, you've probably it's been on it. the big ones, right? Have you guys been on a Royal Caribbean cruise? Mm, no. No, I no. haven't. You've did Carnival, right? I've done Princess I've done and Carnival. Carnival. That's right. I've done Princess, yeah. yeah. Same. But no, I've always wanted to go on a Royal Caribbean yeah. cruise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Me I mean, too. they're one of the biggest cruise yeah. lines in the world. I don't know. I'm a little sketched out by cruise lines, though. I hear so many things all the time. I know. It's like in general about I all know. of them, even yeah. like Disney. I mean, mm, but I people know. like them in general because they're all inclusive for one. Yeah. And it's fun. I mean, mm-hmm. I liked it when I did it. It's cool to wake up somewhere yeah. different every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and like, it's great for families. And everything's on the boat that you need. Like, right. you know, it's got, yeah. you know, entertainment, food. Yeah. room it's a cool experience you get to see multiple places too i think that's one of the biggest benefits yeah. you know yeah you don't just go to one spot so it keeps it exciting every day exactly and so thousands of australians bought tickets for this cruise you know maybe for christmas vacation and we're just ready to unplug and enjoy the holiday season all the passengers were offered a day trip pass to white island and this was an opportunity to step foot on a real life volcano and cross one more item off their bucket list in fact, the opportunity to visit the island is why a lot of people book the cruise in the first place. It's that wow. big of a tourist attraction and a huge selling point. Other passengers decided to take the day trip at the last minute as a spontaneous adventure. You know how 
you know, cruise ships yeah. are, they'll be like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to White Island today. There's a few spots left. Anybody want to go? And so that's, there was actually people going that day that, you know, last minute were like, hey, wow. should we, should we do the White Island oh my tour? God. Sounds like an adventure. And Having like, sure. no idea the potential dangers. Yes. Yeah. So everyone who went was given a brochure with safety precautions, which has been disputed and everything else that they needed to know about this particular tourist adventure. And we say everything else they needed to know, as in everything the cruise company apparently thought they should know. Right, which was not much. Mm. But the brochure said that they would get close to the drama. Hard hats and gas masks would be provided so that they could get close to roaring steam vents, bubbling pits of mud, hot volcanic streams, and the amazing lake of steaming acid. Who wouldn't want to see that though? I mean, that's and it's actually really beautiful. Cool. Yeah. The yeah. acid's like really colorful, it's like green and, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, like bright. We'll green. overlay some footage if you're watching on YouTube, but it is it's gorgeous. Yeah, and all guests were told were to just wear closed-toed shoes and be prepared for a strenuous hike, and that wheelchair users were discouraged from attending. But other than that, the cruise line would take care of everything. It would just be a wonderful day on White Island. On December 9th, two thousand nineteen, the big day arrived. It was time to visit Wide Island on a six hour tour. And there were about 100 tourists who were loaded onto three boats. And these boats were called the PJ4, the Phoenix, and the Tepua Fakari, which all these boats are run by Wide Island tours. The PJ4 left first at 9 30 in the morning, and then the Phoenix followed after at 10 30 a.m. And then the third boat, the Tepua Fakari, left at 11 30 a.m. Also, there was two helicopters that were going out that day. From volcanic air which brought small groups to the island around the same time as these white island tour boats are going out and one of the helicopters was piloted by brian de and he had a group of four german tourists with him that day there was also a brazilian tourist named alessandro kaufman and his wife arlene who were passengers on the second boat that went out called the phoenix and alessandro decided to document the trip in a vlog he was kind of you know vlogging he's not like a big vlog or anything but he was out there mm -hmm. with his cameras and his GoPro filming for much of the day, which is actually how we have a lot of footage from this day is from him. Yep. Boat passengers were given a small metal cone with a colored dot as a boarding pass. They handed the cones to the crew members as they boarded as a physical record of how many people were on board. They were all provided gas masks and yellow hard hats. And then crew members wore orange hats and striped shirts so that they could clearly differentiate themselves from the passengers. So the boats drop their anchors near the island and then the crew loads passengers into these other smaller inflatable rafts. They had about six to 10 of them and then they would, you know, slowly move them over to the island and then crew members help them off the rafts and onto a jetty, which is a small dock or a landing platform at the edge of the island. Yeah, it's really the only way to get on the island because it's, it's of course very rocky with volcanic rock all around it. So right. You can't even bring the big boats even close to it. So it's the only way to get to it is from these little rafts. So before the hike, there was a safety meeting and everyone was reminded to stay on the path and in between tour guides all the time. They were warned not to touch anything or take anything. The guides led them up the winding path towards the caldera. And as they got closer, several people put on their gas masks. There were clouds of white steam rising from the ground and the group stepped around what looked like a pond of steam but the water was boiling hot, at least 100 degrees Celsius, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, burn oh it. One of the guides warned them not to get too close, and he reminded everyone to put their masks on if they needed them and to turn around and crouch down if they were engulfed in any steam. The path to the crater was rocky, but the landscape of the island is absolutely breathtaking. It really does look like being on another planet. It does. There's yellow sulfur crystals that brightens up the rocks, algae that turns the streams green brown and red so it's just a huge array of colors really in one beautiful. space one yeah. natural space it's yeah. beautiful. i mean i get why you'd want to see it. it's yeah. really really cool there's it's, there's not very many places on you know on earth that you can go find these types of colors and mm -hmm. you know just environments all like, in one spot yeah, yeah it literally is like being on another planet mm -hmm. rainbow island yeah Crater Lake was at the center of the island, and this area wasn't terribly hot, but it's highly acidic with a constant flow of steam. Yeah, it's just a lake of acid, basically. Yeah. You wouldn't want to jump in that one. Ugh. And when the wind blows, it momentarily clears the steam to reveal glimpses of the lake underneath it, so you can kind of see it. Yeah, but this is kind of like the highlight. One of the highlights of, mm -hmm. of the tour is this lake of acid, and you know when the, the steam does go away, it's like this beautiful, beautiful lake there. 
So as the groups from the Phoenix start heading back down the path, they spotted Brian's volcanic air helicopter on a landing pad. The Phoenix was waiting near the shore, ready for its passengers to board. The returning group walked through the ruins of the abandoned sulfur mines, and Alessandro captured all of this on video, so we will overlay it. The island was calm at this time. The sky was bright and clear, and you can see the camera tilt down towards his watch. It was 1.49 p.m. The PJ-4 boat was heading back to the mainland at this point, and the Fakari boat had just arrived around 1 p.m. with all of its 42 passengers and crew members. And on the Fakari boat, the passengers were divided into two groups of 19, which were each led by two guides. 25-year-old Kelsey Waghorn led the first group up the path to the crater lake, assisted by 19-year-old Jake Milbank, who was celebrating his birthday that day. 40-year-old Hayden Marshall Inman led the second group, which was assisted by 24-year-old Tiffany Mangi. And this was Hayden's 1,111th trip to the volcano. That's a wow. lot of that's a lot of trips to the volcano. Impressive. He was a skipper, but was filling in as a guide for the cruise ship passengers. Around two o'clock, Kelsey's group was almost back to the shore, and the passengers of the Phoenix had all boarded. The first helicopter from Volcanic Air left at 2:05. Brian was preparing his four passengers to board his helicopter and plan to take off in just a few minutes. Hayden's group from the Fakari boat was heading up the path to Crater Lake at this time, and 24-year-old Stephanie Browett was in this group with her father, Paul, and 21-year-old sister, Crystal, and their mother, Marie, had actually stayed back on the cruise ship that day. But the family had taken, you know, this trip on the cruise to celebrate Crystal's 21st birthday, and when they heard about this day trip to White Island, Stephanie, Crystal, and Paul made a very spontaneous decision to go on it. They wanted to experience the adventure of being on an actual volcano. As Hayden's group walked toward Crater Lake, Stephanie took in the surroundings. Her and Crystal heard their tour guide talking about the volcano, and Crystal was actually taking some video. The guide was actually explaining to them that White Island is at a volcanic alert level of two and approaching level three. And what that means is that once it hits level three, the volcano is literally erupting. So it's the level right before a volcano erupts, and there they are on the island. You would think you'd only be allowed to go on islands with a level one rating. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much, that's pretty much, yeah. If they had known it was level, they shouldn't have even gone out that day. Yeah. Yeah. If I had heard that and I was on there, I'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? I know. Get me the fuck off right now. Yeah. And the tour guy so freaked out. Is anxious the entire time they're there because he knew this. And he actually decided to cut the tour short and head back early because he was clearly that worried about what might happen. And Stephanie wasn't sure what level two meant, but she knew that cutting the tour short was probably a bad sign. They also noticed that the color of the steam coming off of the lake was turning black. Not good. How scary is that, man? Mm. Like it's been white and then all of a sudden it turns black. And they actually took a picture, uh, Crystal, Stephanie, and their father, Paul, together in front of the steam coming off of Crater Lake. You can see the steam is starting to turn darker. Like mm -hmm. there's one side that's darker and one that's white in that picture. We just started seeing black smoke coming out of the crater. And the first thing we did was take a photo, not realizing that's an eruption and the danger. So seconds after this photo was taken, the tour guide leading their group just screamed run. And as they ran, Crystal's phone was still taking the video which is really unbelievable. She got probably, she got the closest footage to yeah. this for sure. Let's go ahead and play hers. It's hard to watch, but Crystal's phone captures the frenzied moments and sheer terror unfolding at 11 minutes past two as the volcano erupts. Run. But imagine being on any sort of tour and all of a sudden your tour guide's just like, run. Oh my gosh. I really can't imagine being in that position. That's, That's so scary. And you're not expecting it because you're trying to relax with your family and just have a good yeah. time. You're on vacation. Just and taking then in the all sights. of a sudden, seconds later, like you're posing for a picture and then you have to run for your life. And what do you do when a volcano is literally just erupting? Like, I know. and you're on it. Especially when you're near the crater. All you can do is run. I mean, there's no nothing else you can do. You can try to mm -hmm. take cover behind rocks, which is what many of them did. But I mean there's literally nothing you can do mm -mm. because everything around them became dark all of a sudden and they couldn't see or breathe at all because the air was so thick 
and hot that it literally burned their skin. That just sounds so horrible. And not to mention the blast, the force of this blast yeah. knocked everyone off their feet. I mean, it's just crazy. Here's Stephanie talking about what happened. The force was just that strong that my whole body was being shoved and pushed and rolled onto the ground. I was just hitting things while getting burnt at the same time. It was the most terrifying moment of my life. The ground was burning hot and I could tell I was burnt really badly. I could see my hand and I could see nails hanging off and skin loose. Moments before, the Phoenix was moving away from the island and the captain had told passengers to look up in the distance at a few small dots in the steam cloud around the crater lake. And those dots were members of Hayden's group standing right on the edge of the lake. So they knew that people were on there. Yeah, they're literally in, right at the mouth of the volcano. In the caldera, yeah. Oh, God. That's terrifying. At 2.10, Hayden's group was heading down the path and Stephanie and her family were posing for their picture in front of the lake. Kelsey's group was waiting near the shore. Then one minute later at 2.11, the passengers on the Phoenix who were all heading away from the island saw a tower of steam suddenly shoot up from the center of the island. And this is all captured by Alessandro on the boat. So there's an amazing clip of this. Well, there's like a, a couple different people took clips of it, of, of the actual eruption itself. But I mean, his is the best. It's absolutely insane. The, I mean, the quality is actually really good of this clip, but oh, God. And knowing, like just seeing the people on the crater's edge as you're pulling away from the island and then this happens. And you can tell the people, you know, if you go watch this clip with the audio, we'll link it below. It's just on YouTube. But you can tell that people just at first were so stunned by the shock of this volcano exploding right in front of them. But then they realize, you can hear their tones just change when they realize that there's people still on. Yeah. And it could have been them. Yeah, they just happened to get off of it. Yeah. You know, a few minutes earlier, pretty much. Before we continue with this story and tell you what happens next, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. Fresh out of San Diego, California comes the only sunglasses brand I'm probably ever going to wear again. And I'm talking about Blender's Eyewear. And you're going to be just as hooked when you see how awesome these shades are. I got a couple pairs from them and I keep going back to buy more because not only are they so affordable, but the styles, there's just so many good styles. And depending on you know what you're wearing that day or what you're doing, you might want a different pair of sunglasses. But by far, my favorite are the Black Tundra and the Deep Space are also really cool frames as well. And I got to say, these are the best quality sunglasses for the price I've ever seen before. And I'm not just saying that. Plus, the styles are off the chain. I mean, they've got all of the newest, latest styles that you could possibly want. There's all different types of styles and even super creative frames out there on their website, which is really, really cool. So they're the perfect pair of sunglasses to wear to the beach, just for a walk with the dog, to the store, driving the car. I mean, literally, there's a pair of sunglasses for any type of activity. I, I wear a different pair in my Jeep than I wear in my other car to when I'm walking, I wear a different pair playing golf. I mean, there's endless different types of sunglasses I could possibly want to wear. And Chase Fisher started Blenders by selling his beachy shades out of a backpack while doubling as a surf instructor on Pacific Beach. And his goal is to create adventurous mid-price eyewear option with the same cool factor as the other leading styles. But unlike the big brand shades that you've probably lost or smashed in the past, pff, done that many times, Blenders are actually affordable. So you're not going to cry as much when the inevitable happens. Uh, I've shed a few tears over expensive sunglasses before. Plus, their team of in-house designers are constantly pumping out new styles. They've got readers and blue light glasses as well, plus snow collection with goggles and accessories. So what are you doing? Live life in forward motion with Blenders today. To score 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter code MileHireVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com. Use code MileHireVIP for 15% off. With blenders, you can rock with pride worldwide. Guys, it's 2021 and no one has time for uncomfortable shoes. That's where Rothy's come in. They have surveyed thousands of customers and the number one word used to describe their shoes is comfy. Many people don't wash their shoes or bags, but Rothy's is here to change that with fully machine washable styles. You don't have to worry about red wine and chocolate. Spills are no problem for you if you've got Rothy's. Just throw them in the washing machine and they'll come out looking brand new. Rothy's are extremely durable and last wash after wash. In fact, an average pair of Rothy's has walked about 1,000 miles. That's like walking from San Francisco to Denver and staying comfortable with every step. 
What I really love about them is what they're made with because not only are they made with 100% recycled materials like water bottles, but they also have just like kind of a thread look to them, almost like knit. And I think they're really unique and it makes them feel very breathable and light. And there's no like wear in time. It's very comfortable as soon as you get them on. I like to keep them clean by washing them. I can just throw them in. It's really easy. So keep it clean with washable shoes and bags from Rothy's. Head to rothys.com slash mile higher to find your new favorites today. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash mile higher. As everybody's seeing this massive column of ash and steam just bursting like 12,000 feet into the air, the captain of the Fakari boat was close to shore still and actually saw the blast firsthand. And that's when he grabbed his radio and shouted, evacuate. Brian screamed, jumped into the water as he dove in himself, and two of his German passengers dove into the water after him, but the other two that were with him didn't make it in time. Moments later, a second burst sent ash, steam, rock, and acid gas barreling across the island and out onto the ocean right toward the Phoenix. It's. I feel like I learned quite a bit about volcanoes just by you know, covering this and learning about this because I just had the idea that it would just be flowing magma, you know, you guys just think lava, but the everything else that comes out along with it, just the rocks, how fast the rocks go flying and they're they're so hot that they're red or so hot that they're white. Isn't that unbelievable? Like that's just so dangerous to, to be hit with something like that. It's so scary. I can't imagine being anywhere near a volcano when it explodes and then not to mention the the gas itself yeah i mean you're being hit poisonous with poisonous gases. gas while you're being burnt all at the same time <laughs> oh, it's God. so horrible and pelted with burning hot yeah. rocks fucking unreal so these types of eruptions steam eruptions or hydrothermal eruptions like this one happen when superheated water inside the volcano rapidly converts the liquid to steam and when it erupts The boiling water and steam can be as hot as 300 degrees Celsius, which is 572 degrees Fahrenheit or even hotter. That is what's hitting these people that are, you know, in this volcano. And these eruptions are oddly quiet and and incredibly quick. So in a matter of minutes, the entire island was swallowed by bright white steam and gray ash and debris within the burst was flying at speeds of 100 meters per second. And as the toxic clouds spilled over the ocean and toward the Phoenix, The captain ordered everyone inside and the skipper quickly steered the boat out of harm's way. Here's actually a clip of some of the passengers on the boat and their reaction to the eruption. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Were the people still on the island? Man. Were the people still on the island? Yeah. Jesus. Oh. Man. I'm shocked at hell. Look. Look. Look at the boat. Oh no. Oh. oh my god. And when the clouds settled, the entire surface of the island was covered in gray ash, just one continuous monotone color. Yeah, it looks like it just literally like snowed there snowed, or something. Yeah. The Fakari boat was anchored nearby and was completely covered in ash. And once they were safely out of the path of the ash cloud, crew members on the Phoenix prepared for a rescue operation and launched inflatable rafts. At this point, 47 people were still on the island, including 38 passengers from the cruise ship. And Kelsey's group was near the shore. Hayden's group was trapped up at the crater. Those inside the Phoenix could see Kelsey's group covered in ash gathered on the landing platform. Also, the force of the blast was so strong that Brian's 1.5 ton helicopter had been thrown from its landing pad. And not only that, the actual rotors themselves are actually bent in half. Like the yeah. helicopter is completely trashed due to this volcano. The crew had to get everyone on the island into inflatable rafts and then onto the Phoenix. So as you can imagine, this was really scary for people. Everyone was frantic on the island. It was total chaos. The crew had to get everyone on the island into a inflatable rafts and then onto the Phoenix and they were just panicking. So it's hard to kind of organize people. And obviously everyone wants to get to safety first. So it's kind of like pandemonium. And one survivor talked about how, when he was trying to go down the ladder for the boats, 
his skin was literally just sliding off his hands. Yeah. I mean, you have to realize that with 500 plus degree temperatures of hot ash and debris and rocks mm -hmm. flying at you, I mean, the burns that the survivor, you know, the victims of Ugh, this I can't imagine. endured is like beyond anything that I think any of us can comprehend. It, truly. I mean, the closest I can experience to any type of burn is like with a curling iron or on the stove. And that hurts so bad. Like everyone knows what that feels mm -hmm. like when you just kind of burn your finger or something. I think burns are probably the worst injury you could possibly yeah. sustain as a human uh, and still survive horrible. it. You know what I mean? Like just the, the sensation of your skin burning and, mm -hmm. and melting, literally melting to a point where it's like sliding off of oh, your, your, your yeah. muscles and your hands. You're uh, just yeah. like, it's separating like your skin's literally melting off of your body and that's what these survivors were were going through as they're also just trying to escape the island i mean they had no idea yeah and there's like ash flying up their nose and their yeah. eyes mm -hmm. are covered Poisonous and it's like gas, you can't like, see you have no idea where you are and then you're near the ocean there's salty water salty ugh, air the on sun, your skin yep, the sun oh terrible just terrible it sounds like Orchard. It really does. Yeah. And as they started loading up the injured people and seeing how bad it was, crew members asked passengers to just stop filming, which is good because I can't imagine how. Oh my God. That's the last annoying that would be yeah. like someone's like in your face with a camera and then is uploading it. And well, and, yeah. Yeah. It's just trauma. I mean, people are literally screaming and in agony and pain. The survivors and passengers asked the crew repeatedly when help was coming. You know, that's the biggest concern is they're stuck on an island. So crew members expected search and rescue helicopters to just arrive at any moment. They rescued the guides, Kelsey and Jake, and the 19 passengers in their group, along with Brian and his four guests who had all survived. Immediately after severe burns, victims can actually walk and talk just because their bodies aren't registering the extent of the damage. But within minutes, their skin starts blistering and swelling. And if the burns are bad enough, your skin will just slide right off. Exposure to toxic gas can also have a delayed effect too. Every breath gets harder. Your throat and your tongue swells up and the victim can barely breathe. A person can be fully conscious and talking one minute and dead the next. Trauma surgeons actually call this critical time after a serious injury the golden hour. If patients are not treated within the golden hour, their chances of surviving are right. a lot less likely. And that's why it was so important that there was help coming to rescue these survivors so that, you know, right. hopefully they could get them to a hospital, you know, or to just somewhere else other than the island within the hour to try and treat their injuries before, you know, they they succumb to their injuries. I mean, that's a very real possibility. Phoenix crew member Paul Kingy boarded the Fakari to search for more survivors with the boat's captain, David Plews. As they scanned the island, Paul saw someone emerge from the ash. It was 19-year-old Jesse Langford. He had been in Hayden's group with his parents and sister. He was near the crater lake when the volcano erupted, and it was miraculous that he survived. Although his entire body, face, torso, arms, hands, legs, and feet were severely burned, even under his clothes. Captain David Plews took Jesse on the Fakari, and Paul stayed behind to continue searching for survivors. So the fact that these guys just jumped in and yeah. immediately started to try to help and save people is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, search and rescue helicopters still hadn't arrived, so the Phoenix was on its way back to the mainland, and the passengers and crew were doing their best to care for the injured on board. The people who had on multiple protective layers had the worst burns on their hands and faces, but others were just wearing t-shirts and shorts that day, and their entire bodies from head to toe were burnt. Thin fabrics obviously did nothing to protect them. The most severe burns had no skin left at all. It had literally just dripped right off Ugh. of their bodies. Ugh. The Man. passengers and crew worked quickly to assess the burns, cutting away clothes and wiping ash from the wounds. Oh. They gathered all the water balls they could find and started a human chain to the survivors. They poured water over the burns to cool the temperature and they covered raw flesh with scraps of clothes and poured water over it to create a second skin. But the slightest gust of wind or hint of sunlight was <sighs> absolutely excruciating to the survivors. Victims had layers of thick ash in their eyes, ears, mouths, and noses, and the other passengers scraped away the ash to clear their eyes and airways. There were more than 20 survivors on the boat along with the passengers and crew, and they moved the most severely injured people to the front of the boat and laid them out on the floor. They barely made a sound as they drifted in and out of consciousness, although there were some that were screaming and crying out in pain on the other side of the boat 
And as passengers cleaned the ash from their wounds, their screams only got louder. Like that, I mean, nothing's so worse than cleaning a burn, but mm. to have these types of burns and mm. oh, I can't even imagine. So bad. Several victims had burns over most of their bodies that were swelling and blistering. Some started to go into shock as their body temperatures plummeted. The other passengers did their best to comfort them. They covered the survivors in foil blankets. And when that wasn't enough, they pulled their own jackets and shirts off to wrap around them. Oh, that's so sweet. When their body temperatures kept dropping, though, some of the passengers held them in their arms, pressing their burned and melting flesh against their own skin. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That really just shows you, like, the yeah. good of humanity. Seriously, to, to jump in in a situation like this. Help and, strangers. Yeah. And you see somebody suffering like, like well, you'd these hope they would do it for you. If Absolutely. the boats were switched, you know, you'd Absolutely. hope it would be the other way around. I would, I would do it for somebody. If, Me too. If I'd just be so ends. grateful to be alive. Seriously. I mean, that could be you. That yeah, could have been absolutely. you that was, you know, burnt from head to toe. But what's crazy is that the trip from White Island back to the mainland is 90 minutes. And if you've ever been on a boat Gosh. for 90 minutes in open ocean waters like this, uh, Kendall and I have a few times and it is, it can be rough. And I, I like can pink. only imagine have, being a burnt, you know, burnt from head to toe, being on a boat that's rocking and bouncing on the water going as fast as it possibly can for 90 minutes dude that is a nightmare that is hellish thinking about that yeah the boat ride itself was literal torture for these victims and it just felt like an eternity so people on the mainland had watched the eruptions and some of them knew that their loved ones had been on the island that day imagine how helpless you would yeah, feel my god other skippers who saw the blast alerted the coast guard and dispatchers sent 11 rescue choppers the two fastest were like equipped flying emergency rooms and could start treating victims right away. But the helicopter pilots weren't sent to White Island. They were told it was too dangerous to land there. Yep, the volcano was still erupting. So instead, they were sent to the Fakatani to pick up victims and transport them to the burn centers. Which this, this is just the biggest thing here for me. It's like you have coast guard helicopters i mean they're literally yeah. these people are trained to go head into danger i mean if this were any type of war situation mm -hmm. or a human conflict those pilots would have flew into danger to try and save people but for whatever reason they somebody told them or you know the head of the coast guard mm -hmm. decided that oh there's this risk that it could still erupt and you know i don't want to put my guys in harm's way so we're just going to stay you know here on the mainland and figure it out some other way to get to them. And don't they have equipment to protect themselves from that to some degree? Well, I mean the heat, I mean, you know, ash is still falling, but like the majority of that heat has gone away cuz the eruption mm -hmm. is over. So, you know, and even then if it, if they had gone, they should have equipment to if it for whatever reason kept erupting well, and it happened again that they would be somehow equipped for that. Mm -hmm. I'm no expert, but it just confuses me that like firefighters have the ability to walk into flames walk into ash with like they have yeah. masks and stuff to be able to breathe and protect their their body so i'm confused why that wasn't given to these rescuers so that they were able to go in safely like i feel like if you had the proper equipment yeah you should be able to go in there and be I okay i guess to play devil's advocate which i do not agree with their decision at all i guess they could have been thinking that they could be hit with giant flying debris because you know how much yeah. is a suit of well you have like a helmet and but right, helicopters themselves are very fragile and like could be knocked if you fly near a, a volcano that's still spewing mm. off but still they could take the helicopter down but in this yeah. situation You've got a bunch of of innocent people on this island yeah. that need rescued. You know, do you, I feel like you take that chance? Take the risk, absolutely. And, you know, with those types of helicopters, you don't even need to land in order to get people. You can send a basket down to descend from the helicopter itself and put people in these like almost like stretcher baskets, and yeah. then you you lift them back up. You don't even need to land. These right. helicopters are literally made to rescue people out of the ocean. Like that's their job. Mm -hmm. So. It could have a hundred percent been done, and they could have just flown helicopter after helicopter out there to pick these victims up. And but, imagine what it would be like to just be lying there helplessly, thinking yeah. help is on its way, mm -hmm. and they're just not coming. They're not just. They got an order not to go out there, and even the pilots themselves that were ready to go were like had no didn't understand how these victims were supposed to get to to the mainland if they had no way to do so, and. 
when while this is all happening, there were actually several local helicopter pilots who had seen the eruption and you know launched their own rescue operation because they're like, well, if the freaking Coast Guard's not going to do yeah. it, then somebody's got to help these poor people. Yep. So we're going to do it. Which is so cool. They're like heroes for doing Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Although it's not ideal because you don't have stretchers and no, you, have, bed. No you have to like sit people up in helicopter seats. Yeah, it's not, it's not burn victims. ideal at all. I mean, you. No. I mean, they don't have all the supplies you need to treat burn victims and you know provide some level of comfort to these poor people that yeah. were just blown up in a volcano. But I guess it's better than nothing, you know? Yeah, it I is. mean, just to get you off the island because yeah. for all they know, it could have erupted again. I mean, they don't know. It could have erupted yeah. and then the rest of those survivors are... You know, there's no hope for them. Yeah, those guys are heroes for stepping in. So a man named John Funnel, a 69-year-old search and rescue service veteran, headed to the island shortly after the blast. Pilots Jason Hill and Tom Story also took off in a second helicopter at 2.50, and pilot Mark Law took off a few minutes later. And all Jason and Tom had on board was a first aid kit, and they had no clue what they were flying into at all. Holy shit. So I want to insert a few clips of them talking about, you know, their perspective on this because it's mm-hmm. absolutely just amazing what the, what they, they dealt with. We were just going out there to, to help. You know, when you're human, you, you do what you can to save other humans' lives as far as I'm concerned, hoping that if anyone was on the island, they weren't uh, hurt. But that was not the case. It was just like a movie set and something you'd never prepared for. There was a lot of victims and... Uh, a lot of burns and yeah, a lot of people lying pretty still. A short while later, a fourth helicopter took off at 305 with two pilots, Tim Barrow and Graham Hopcroft. John Funnel arrived first and circled the island. He had the most experience with rescue operations and his job was to communicate by radio with the other pilots and by cell phone with the police and Coast Guard. Stephanie Brow and 19 others were stranded near Crater Lake. She had no idea where her father and sister were. But finally, she heard her father, Paul, calling out her name. Here is her talking about that experience. After a while, I heard my dad scream out my name. And that's when I responded, yes, back to him. Then another 20 or 30 minutes later, he called Stephanie out again. And it happened again. And I realized he was checking up and making sure I was still awake the whole time. I was just so happy to hear his voice because I thought I had lost him. I didn't know if I could make it for that long, if I could stay awake, because just staying awake was taking so much energy. And you knew you were getting worse and worse as every second passed. And as they landed their choppers, Jason, Tom, and Mark saw the mangled volcanic air helicopter that had been thrown from the landing pad. And they realized how strong the blast had to have been and how hard it would have been for anyone to survive it. They exited their choppers into a foot of ash. And even with glasses and gas masks on, their eyes were burning and their throats were already stinging. The volcano was just raining down ash. Steam was still rising and another eruption could happen at any minute. The conditions on the surface were toxic and it was impossible to breathe without wearing the gas mask. From their helicopters, they had spotted a group of people near Crater Lake. They ran up the path toward what they hoped would be survivors. They found 20 victims below the rim of the crater. They checked their injuries, put gas masks on them, and gave them water. Their skin was so burned that it was black. Some of them were unconscious, and others were asking for water. One woman was throwing up ash and blood. They reassured the survivors that help was there, and they weren't alone. And they also expected the first responders to arrive any minute, and they were planning to start, you know, helping prep them to get transported back to shore. I remember they kept saying, it's not helped coming in another 20 minutes. I believe they were waiting for the rescue crew and the ambos to come and arrive. So they kept reassuring us another 20 minutes, they're on their way. I remember that we heard a helicopter above us and someone near me got really excited and started saying, there's help, there's help coming to rescue us. And a while later, there were people near us screaming out to us we're here we're here helps here helps arrived they found the guides hayden marshall inman and tiffany mangy near a stream they were both unresponsive and across from the stream they found 17 year old winona langford she was unresponsive too winona had been on the tour with her parents and her brother jesse who is currently aboard the fakari clinging to life a lot of victims looked like they had been facing the blast Footage from their cell phones would later show that several of them had stopped to film the moments before the first eruption. 
The second eruption was horizontal and came right down toward them. They were hit with a blast of hydrofluoric acid, sulfuric acid, and superheated gases and rocks. Multiple victims had internal injuries and one was missing a chunk of his skull. There were different sets of footprints on top of the ash and a first aid kit nearby. They figured out that Hayden and Tiffany had tried to lead the group back down the path after the eruption. And as people fell unconscious, they put gas masks on them. So they literally tried to yeah. protect their you know, guests as best as they could. And a trail of footprints going up the path showed that Hayden had actually tried to go back and help more people. And he may have been able to make it to the shore, but he chose to stay behind and help. Tiffany had led Winona and Jesse partway down the creek. Jesse was the only one of the three who made it out alive. At this point, there were more survivors than they could have hoped for, but they didn't have much time. Tom reassured his friends that help would be there soon. Search and rescue would arrive there any minute. John was still circling ahead in his helicopter when he radioed down with devastating news. The rescue choppers were ordered to stay away from the island. A fleet of 11 helicopters were waiting at the Fukatani just sitting there doing yep. nothing, ordered not to go help. And this decision was made in part by St. John medical director, Dr. Tony Smith, who believed it wasn't safe for them to land on the island and wasn't willing to risk the lives of his team. So obviously this was a very controversial decision and people are still questioning whether or not this was the right decision to this day. So here's Tony talking about it. The information we were receiving at that time was that it wasn't safe to land on the island. Those two pilots did relay the information that it was safe and then in fact they had landed plus two other pilots. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not privy to what that information was. But you're the head of St John with respect. Isn't this something that you should be aware of? Uh, on that day, we were receiving huge amounts of information from multiple people. Who else's information would have been more important than the perspective of the two pilots who were on the island at the time? The decision that was made at the time was that the most appropriate thing to do was to fly to the Fokatani airfield. Were you relying on the untrained pilots to do the job? Absolutely not. But that's effectively what they did. These untrained pilots did the job of search and rescue crews. We recognise that those pilots uh, made a decision on the day uh, which was different to the decision that we made. We recognise that and we understand it. The pilots on White Island were stunned and unsure of what to do next. Mark was the first to act. He announced that they would rescue the survivors themselves. Jason and Tom jumped into action. We just realised it was up to us now. Um, you know, we didn't have all the right equipment, so we just did what we could um, with what we had. And all we had was us, so... Jason ran back down the path to get his helicopter and bring it closer to the victims. And once he landed, they loaded five people into it. And Stephanie's father, Paul Browett, was still alive, but he told the pilots to help his daughters before helping him. We uh, went to pick up Paul and he, he just said, you know, um, take my daughters first. He was thinking of his daughters and not himself. Yeah, when you're a dad, I guess you want to do anything you possibly can for your kids. Stephanie was still conscious when they brought her into the helicopter and they loaded her father in after her. I remember them saying, you're going to be OK, you're going to be OK. And they grabbed me in the helicopter and I remember being happy that they had placed me in the front seat. Jason took off at 3.48 p.m. He talked to survivors the entire flight to try to keep them awake and alive. And Stephanie, this is one of the TikToks I saw of hers. She actually talks about how she believed they saved her life by talking to her because she was fading. You yeah, know? yeah. You got to keep people gotta conscious. You got to fight the urge to just give in. Mark got his helicopter next. Tom realized that several people who were alive when they got there were now dead. That's how fast things had to move. They were really under the gun. Yeah, I mean, these people have critical injuries mm -hmm. that... Horrible injuries. You know, if they're, they don't go... If they don't get help and evacuated out of there, you know, within that golden hour, then they're most likely not going to survive. As he carried 15-year-old Zoe Hosking to Mark's chopper, she held on to him. And by the time he got there, she was lifeless. But he loaded her in anyway, and unfortunately, she didn't survive. Her stepfather, Gavin Dallow, died during the blast, and her mother, Lisa, was the woman throwing up blood and ash. She ended up being rescued by the pilots and in a coma for two months, but she actually survived. The last helicopter piloted by Tim Barrow and Graham Hopcraft finally arrived. Mark directed them to one of the victims, a teenage boy. Tim and Graham got him on the helicopter. Mark's chopper was at capacity with the five victims, so he took off. 
Tim then flew into the crater at Mark's direction to get the last living victim. The five pilots had loaded 12 people onto three helicopters and they were on the island for approximately 40 minutes in total. That's amazing work. Yeah, seriously. For people who are not trained for this mm-hmm. at all. Yeah. Just on the fly. Just jumped in action. They saw it. Had no and... idea this was going to explode that no, day. No, they could have all lost their lives. Yeah. 100%. Oh, easily. So scary. Tom decided to stay behind to gather the dead bodies so they'd be easier to move when a helicopter came back for them. He maneuvered over rocks and across the stream to drag and carry the bodies into one spot. These guys are heroes for sure. Seriously. And John was still circling overhead and radioed down when a search and rescue chopper finally arrived. And medical director Tony Smith himself was on board. Tom met them on the shore and said there were eight bodies and no more survivors. They were ordered to leave the island immediately. All of these pilots were mm-hmm. that weren't, you know, part of the Coast Guard. It was too dangerous to stay, you know, if no one was even left to save at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The Coast Guard met the Phoenix before it reached the shore and boarded to start treating the injured. Medical professionals and ambulances were waiting on the mainland to take the survivors right to the hospital. Hayden's brother Mark had heard about the eruption and knew Hayden was working as a guide that day. And he was actually waiting with the emergency workers to find out if his brother had made it off the island. The other guides on the Phoenix told him that Hayden never got on the boat. And obviously Mark was devastated, but not surprised. He knew his brother would never leave unless he was sure everyone was safe. That was just the kind of person he was. Back on the cruise ship, family members of the people who went out on the tour still had no idea that the volcano had erupted. Some of them heard from loved ones back home who saw it on the news. So Mm -hmm. people on the ship, Royal Caribbean didn't even announce that. It was like, there was an eruption. And unfortunately, one of the tours that left from our boat, you know, went out there probably because they know people would panic and they don't even know they don't have any answers for them and they don't have an explanation of why their loved ones were even on this island in the first place this is crazy too they actually when people try to get more information from the staff about you know what had happened to their loved ones they were told nothing and were just sent to a room to wait and they actually waited for hours some of them missing the last minutes their family members were alive as they lay dying in the hospital that's so sad i would be so so mad like no idea that, that you could have spent been there by right. their side god i would that would have done anything to be with my loved one knowing like oh my god they're in the hospital like i don't want them to die alone i need to say and they're just waiting on the ship yeah Ugh, no answers horrible that's <sighs> just cruel the family members of the eight people left on the island were informed that no one was going back to retrieve their bodies and that they may never be able to bury their loved ones Ugh. mark and tom wanted to go back to get them but the authorities refused to allow it It was too dangerous. And that night a rainstorm caused a mudslide of ash and it was now impossible to get to the bodies. Hayden and Winona had actually been washed away by the rain and the mudslide and Navy divers recovered Hayden's body on December 11th, but they dropped him in deep water during the operation. What the fuck? Oh my God. What the fuck? It's crazy. They dropped him? Yeah, they just accidentally dropped him. Oh my gosh. And couldn't recover him. I feel so bad for these families. Seriously. Military personnel wearing hazmat suits went back four days after the eruption on December 13th, where they were able to recover six of the eight bodies. And the search for Hayden and Winona actually was called off on December 24th, and they were never found. How sick is that? That's so sad. It could have been yeah. saved. Yeah. Could have been taken taken off, not you know, mm-hmm. save their bodies. Exactly. Just fucked up. So we're gonna talk more about the aftermath of the eruption after we get back from this break. So Most of us have probably browsed the internet in incognito mode, right? It's probably not as incognito as you think, though. And why would that be? Incognito mode, like the Chrome browser itself, is a Google product. And Google has made its fortune by tracking your movements online. There's even a $5 billion class action lawsuit against the company in California where it's accused of secretly collecting user data. And Google's defense? Incognito does not mean invisible like many of us think. So how do you actually make yourself invisible as possible online? The answer is using ExpressVPN. Turns out that even in incognito mode, your online activity still gets tracked and data brokers still get to buy and sell your data. One of these data points is your IP address. Data harvesters use your IP to uniquely identify you and your location. But with ExpressVPN, baby, your connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server and your IP address is masked. You can literally make yourself appear from anywhere in the world, which is awesome. So every time you connect to ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address shared by many other ExpressVPN customers. 
which makes it harder for those third-party companies to harvest and sell your data. Best of all, ExpressVPN is easy. It's super easy, in fact, and you can use it on any device you want to, phone, laptop, or smart TV, and once you get it installed, all you have to do is tap one button for instant protection. So if you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash milehire and get three extra months for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash milehire. Check out expressvpn.com slash milehire today. Imperfections. We all have them. So why do we need our groceries to be any different? Get your groceries from Imperfect Foods to help create a kinder, less wasteful food system that embraces food of every shape, size, and physical appearance. Every year, billions of pounds of food go to waste, often because they don't live up to the strict cosmetic standards of grocery stores. Don't you wish there was a way to prevent all of that waste? Well, Imperfect Foods is on a mission to reimagine grocery delivery for a kinder, less wasteful world. They deliver sustainable, affordable groceries, including produce, quality protein, eggs, and dairy, and pantry staples right to your door. Plus, they're always adding fun, tasty new discoveries for you to try each week. All you have to do is sign up, create your flexible, personalized grocery plan, and then shop online each week. And then you can get affordable and sustainable groceries delivered right to your door. It's super easy. And within Perfect Foods, grocery shopping fits seamlessly into your life, and every week is a tasty adventure. So sign up with Imperfect Foods today and save time, save money, save food from going to waste. And right now, Imperfect Foods is offering our listeners 20% off plus free shipping on your first order when you go to imperfectfoods.com and make sure to use promo code MILEHIRE. Try Imperfect Foods now and for a limited time, get 20% off plus free shipping on your first order. Just go to imperfectfoods.com and use promo code MILEHIRE to sign up. That's 20% off plus free shipping at imperfectfoods.com. Offer code MILEHIRE. So the eruption of White Island killed 22 people and severely injured 25. Two of the people rescued by the helicopter survived, Stephanie Browett and Lisa Dallow. The other 10 died. Several victims lived for days or weeks after the eruption before dying in the hospital. Among the dead were 14 Australians, five Americans, two New Zealanders, and one German. The survivors had traumatic injuries that will affect them for the rest of their lives, including severe burns to their skin, lungs, and amputations. Collectively, they had the equivalent of 16 bodies worth of skin grafts. Stephanie Browett and her father, Paul, were put into medically induced comas. Her sister, Crystal, was one of the eight bodies that were left behind on the island. And just as a reminder, Crystal is the one that took that footage close up yeah. as she was running away. Yeah, they were the literally blast. right yeah. where the blast happened. Mm -hmm. Stephanie was in the coma for weeks. Paul died about a month after the eruption. So she literally lost like yeah. half her family. Yeah, I her mean. father and her sister. This was supposed to be a special day for them. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. It broke me a little. I wish I could thank my dad and tell him that he was a hero. I wish I could just let him know how amazing his actions were on that day. And I just don't understand why. Sometimes I just question why I'm here. Why was it me out of everyone? I really miss the humor in the house. I miss the back chatting that we had and our inside jokes. It was never quiet. <laughs> there was never a dull moment. We have a lot of memories together, really good memories. I push forward not only for myself, but for my mum, my dad and my sister because I want to make them proud and I want to make them happy and I want them to know that I'm here and I'm grateful to be here and I'm going to make them proud. If search and rescue helicopters had been sent to the island immediately after the eruption, Crystal and Paul and many others may have survived and Stephanie may have been less severely injured. It's very upsetting just because I know it definitely would have made a difference for a lot of the people that were there that were waiting. You know, lives could have been saved that weren't that day. Stephanie's recovery has been horrific, as you can imagine. It's been long and painful. She suffered severe burns, and the first two joints of her fingers were completely amputated. So I was burnt from my bottom all the way down to my ankles. And I do have some interesting TikToks I wanted to put in here that she made. I just think it's kind of interesting to hear her explaining some of this. Hi guys, let's talk about burns percentage. 
Okay, so how do they work out the percentage of burns you've sustained? They use this chart above. So that chart is a picture of an adult. It tells you what percentage each body part is worth if that were to get burnt. And overall, it adds up to 100%. Of course, if your torso, for example, isn't completely burnt, they would work out how much of your torso is burnt and what that equals out of the 18% that it's worth. And then they add all of it up together. So for myself, I was burnt up to 70%. Now, of course, an adult's burn chart varies compared to a child's burn chart, as we have different physical attributes. Therefore, it's worked out differently. Okay, thank you guys for watching. Bye! Hi guys! So, a lot of you have been asking about the surgery I had recently, and that was on my left hand, as you can see. What they did was cut in between my first finger and my thumb so that they can get more of a gap in between. That way I can pick things up a lot easier and wrap my hands around things. And then they grabbed some skin from my thigh to put in that area. So it's a decent cut. It looks like a shark bite. <laughs> It's very horrid. However, it is healing quite well. It's been about three weeks now and it's making some great progress. Here you can get a better idea of the gap. Um, so as you can see, it's fully covered because it still needs dressing changes all the time. But hopefully this week I can start hand therapy again and get my hand moving. Thanks for watching. Hi guys. Let's talk about a big misconception for burn survivors. People trying to help me by telling me that I need to have more collagen to help my skin. People, my body is in collagen overdrive right now. <laughs> See that big scarring right there, very raised? That right there is a buildup of way too much collagen. My body knows it's been through such severe trauma and it's producing so much collagen trying to help that. And then instead it's creating these huge pieces of thick scarring that I don't want right now. So no, I don't need any more collagen, I promise. In fact, those gummy bear collagen things you see, they don't really work. The amount of them that you have to eat to actually get a proper amount of collagen, uh, not in those little things, trust me. <laughs> okay, bye guys. Mwah! Stephanie was released from the hospital in May of 2020 and reunited with her mother, Marie, and her beloved Collie, Arlo. And she has been documenting her journey on social media. We just played some of her TikToks, but she's also on Instagram. So we'll have all that linked below. She's just a very fact, inspirational yeah, person to she's follow. sharing her story and yeah. her journey. And, and being so positive. Yeah. It blows me away. And she's just so like such a bright light, like a breath yeah. of fresh air on yeah. my For You page. I love running across Stephanie's content. I definitely recommend following her. So Jesse Langford has burns over 90% of his body, but he still survived. On December 30th, he wrote the eulogy for his mother, father, and his sister. That's so horrible, man. It's so tragic. And at the end of this, I mean, this tragedy left a lot of people asking if this disaster could have been avoided completely. In 2013, mud eruptions from the volcano were so dangerous that scientists refused to go to the island. And the last time why island fully erupted was in 2016. And during this eruption, the entire walkway to Crater Lake was covered with deposits from this eruption. And if tours had been going on, there would have been absolutely no survivors. But the blast happened in the middle of the night, so no one was there. And scientists put out a warning about the eruption, which should have made it clear how dangerous it was to be on the island. And after that eruption happened, tours should have been shut down immediately. But nothing happened. In late 2019, volcanic activity on the island was increasing. And on December 3rd, Six days before 100 tourists from the cruise ship were brought to the island, the government body that monitors White Island put out a volcanic alert bulletin, and it said that the volcanic alert level remains at 2, and moderate volcanic unrest continues. The bulletin also clearly stated that White Island, quote, may be entering a period where eruptive activity is more likely than normal. Again, alert level 2 is the highest level for a volcano before it erupts, and it means there's a chance things will settle down. That's the thing is they can go up and down. Those levels can, but it's much more likely once it reaches that level two heading towards a level three, that an eruption is imminent. And for months, scientists had observed an increase in volcanic activity. In October, 2019, seismic tremors and sulfur dioxide gas emission rates were at the highest levels since the 2016 eruption, which were all clear signs that another eruption was literally on the horizon. 
The tourists who accepted the day trip pass to the island were never warned about any of these things, mm -hmm. any of these possible risk factors. There was also no instruction for what to do if the volcano erupted or an emergency procedure to follow if the guide suspected that an eruption might happen. I mean, what are you really going to do other than run? I mean, yeah. there's not much you can do yeah. to protect yourself from a volcano erupting on top of you. That Fam is unbelievable. Yeah. Isn't it? It is. The fact that the tour's not checking with mm -hmm. the actual monitoring agency for volcanoes to make sure it's safe to take their patrons to the island. Yeah. That's like, what? Or How worse, they knew about it and they just didn't care. That... And that's what's what's crazy. And we like we talked about in the beginning, this is a big part of the economy there. So I understand they don't want to cancel it but, ever because it like yeah. can affect their economy. Yeah, but, but come on, this is human life here. Well, yeah. Plus, they could get the shit suit out of them. Like, yeah. why would they want to take that chance of that right. liability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the actual boats. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's the thing, too, is like they should have at least warned, you know, told the people, hey, there's a level to, if they're going to run tours, they should have said, Hey, just so you know, the volcanoes at alert level yeah. two, there is a possibility that this thing could erupt while you're there. Do you still want to go on this, on this excursion? Mm -hmm. And then people could make their own decision. And you know, if you decide to go into a dangerous situation like that, then that's, that's, that's a little different. bit different than mm -hmm. just straight up, not telling people that yeah. mm -hmm. this, this volcano is about to blow, Yeah, you know, because to not these people, tell they're thinking it's just the same as a snorkeling excursion or yeah. rock climbing or something well, you know like there's for always example, some risk but while we were in australia uh i think we were in sydney when we went on our whale oh hell. excursion that was bad. whale watching excursion that was scary <laughs> i almost went off the boat that was like <laughs> it was bad <laughs> and, and obviously doesn't compare to this at all but they did was, tell us it was potentially one of the scariest things that we've ever experienced together as a couple and the we're going out into whale open watching. waters to go see some whales breach they're like oh that'd be fun and we it's didn't like realize our first we were, day in australia you could go on a big boat or a little boat and we decided you know we were going to go on a little boat could be more fun and they straight up warned us they're like hey the seas are choppy out there today <laughs> they said today it's you're bad. gonna get wet but i don't even think they knew how bad it was no they didn't even explain it but i mean they're like used to it so they're not gonna like Oh, we were such Americans. dumb asses. We were like, no, we're fine. In fact, we're going to sit in the front. We're like front row seats. <laughs> we were soaking wet by the end of that thing. Guys, this was like, this is something I have nightmares about. Like it was horrible. Like we get out there and it's just like the seas were like tossing but it, this But at least they around. did warn us. You're yeah. right. They, they did, did give warn us, us and we said, yeah, fuck it. Let's do it. <laughs> Mistake. And we regret that decision every day. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know what? It was a good experience it was, to yeah. some degree. Well, uh, actually, you know, it was, it was really like, awful. Never mind. Closest thing we've come to a near death experience, I think. I thought I was going to lose you, my wife on that trip. Yeah, right? I was going to say you were fine. You weren't going anywhere. I was I, not fine. Well, I tried to throw <laughs> up off the boat and I almost fell off. It was bad. Like imagine being like the boats like maybe I thought it was 20 in, like, feet a long. Movie. And it was so wild. I mean, the open ocean and off the coast mm -hmm. of Australia is no joke. Like it's <laughs> tossing you up 20, 30 feet back down, smashing against the, mm -hmm. you know, the water and Kendall's hurling vomit everywhere <laughs> about to go overboard. Not everywhere off the boat. <laughs> yeah. It was bad. But anyways, I was polite. You were trying to be. And, and the tour guys were like acting like it was no big deal. So maybe we were just being a baby about it, but. They're no, like these baby ass so. Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone on the <laughs> boat. There was multiple yeah. people. That Everybody were, like, was fucked up on the boat. It was scary. It was scary. It was but really it's a stormy. Prime example of yeah. like you need to at least give your, you know, mm -hmm. tourists a heads up mm -hmm. that hey, this may not happen. be a normal tour yeah. because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Conditions so, are different today. Right. It should be like day to day updating and people on conditions. If you're a good tour company, you're gonna do that. You know, mm -hmm. you want to look at safety of your of your passengers is number one priority. Yeah. But for whatever reason, nothing was told to these these poor people before they headed to White Island that day. And Terrible. subsequently, there was investigations into the tragedy, and these were launched by the coroner and two government agencies, the New Zealand Police and WorkSafe, which is the government's workplace health and safety regulator under the Department of Labor. And the WorkSafe was actually formed in 2013 to oversee regulations on the adventure tourism industry in New Zealand. And operators who failed to comply with regulations could get five years in prison up to $1 million in fines. So the government actually filed charges in November 2020 against 10 organizations and three individuals involved in tour operations. And the investigation found that tour operators didn't follow health and safety rules and that the eruption was foreseeable. 19 of the 22 people who died had been passengers on the cruise ship. And the departure of the ship had been delayed while police collected DNA samples from the victims' rooms. 
The itinerary for the rest of the cruise was changed and it arrived back in Sydney on December 16th. And the passengers were given the equivalent of one day's fare aboard the ship as compensation. That's it. That's all they did. That's fucking just disgusting. Like, here's your money back. Sorry. Yeah. yeah sorry the for fuck? the inconvenience. Yeah. Like, oh sorry we sent your loved ones into God. a volcano that was going to erupt. <sighs> it's so upsetting. Sydney-based lawyer Rita Yosef became a spokesperson for many of the survivors and family members of the deceased. And Rita believes that it was the responsibility of the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line to be monitoring the risk factors of visiting an active volcano and communicating that risk to the passengers so they can make an informed decision. And you got to hear Stephanie's take on it because Mm -hmm. it's wild. It really hurts and upsets me and frustrates me that we weren't told. It's a major factor in making an informed decision about going on the island and visiting it. And it's just such a huge, huge piece of information to be left out. Even if the passengers knew the volcano was active, that wasn't enough information for them to understand the risk, right? We don't, we're not Mm -hmm. all volcano experts, you know, and most scientists define an active volcano as one that has erupted in the last 10,000 years. And that's honestly been my view about active volcanoes is I, I just assume like, Oh, you know, like we're going to happen to be in the 10,000 year chance of this volcano erupting. So later in 2020, passengers and family members started filing lawsuits against Royal Caribbean in Miami, Florida, which is where they're headquartered for failing to warn them of the potential dangers of visiting White Island. Lawsuits were filed by multiple survivors, including American couple Matthew Yuri and Lauren Barham, who were on their honeymoon. American couple Ivy and Paul Reed and Australian mother and daughter Marie and Stephanie Brout, who've been you know, featuring in this episode. These victims had severe and life-threatening burns over large portions of their body and suffered permanent scarring and reduced use of their limbs. And obviously just the mental trauma that they went through is just horrific. And in December, 2020, Royal Caribbean filed lawsuits in Australia uh, back against the survivors. <laughs> That's so fucking horrible. Including Stephanie. How crazy is that? The cruise line suing them. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they claim uh, the cruise line's claiming a clause in the ticket contract that says that only courts in New South Wales, Australia can hear legal disputes related to the eruption and ask the court to prevent the victims from pursuing legal action in the United States. And these court cases are still ongoing. That is well, so fuck horrible. Royal Caribbean. Don't support those people. Yeah, Seriously, I agree. That's terrible. To I mean, go and then sue the survivors mm-hmm. when you're the ones that, that... What a slap in the face. Seriously. That is truly... The sickest thing. Money above all yeah, else for these yeah, co- corporations. Over everything. All these people died and they still are trying to figure out how they can save some money and in save the their reputation. And yep. No. I'm telling you, I think a lot of the cruise lines are trash. trash. Like I think they just I've heard so many things about so many of them that I just don't think I think there's a big issue with being able to provide safety for that many people on a boat. Yeah. I, I just there's something I don't like cruises. I've went on a really really Babe. crappy one Babe. in the bahamas and we i'll never do on, one again that was a tiny boat <laughs> that, was that was not even that was nothing like a royal Caribbean it was like cruise. out of miami or something when it was like that two was... days <laughs> never again <laughs> that was never the funniest again. experience screw that never again never doing it well okay it's nothing like that but i mean cruises are pretty cool. people fall say, off people go missing off cruise ships i mean josh you're just scared of them because you've never been on one i don't like them but i don't know now that i hear all these things like it is it is scary you hear a lot there's a lot of cruise stories out there of just sketchiness people going missing on cruises yeah i don't know doesn't make it it just it, it seems like there's too many risks to it and there's probably good cruise lines out there though i bet some smaller ones i don't know i think it's some of these giants that are really the problem the royal caribbean carnival yeah they just don't care disney they don't really care about your well-being and safety aboard their ship it doesn't feel like it with the and then to sue people after doing that i mean wow i'm just stunned yeah yeah total trash after the disaster reporters and journalists all over the world question why anyone would ever tour an active volcano but the truth is, is that it's not that dangerous. Statistically, you're more likely to die mountain climbing, you know, boating around, jet boating, swimming, or driving a car. Over the last 500 years, an average of one person a year has died on a volcano. But regardless of how safe it is, all tours of the island have been stopped indefinitely after this, which honestly, we should not be going mm-hmm. to an extremely active volcano, period. Like, I get that there's like the 10,000 year thing, but how can you, you can't guarantee that. You can't yeah. guarantee the safety well, of somebody going to. It could go at any point. You I mean, know. I think you should have like some more training and 
be ready for more extreme, can, like something to happen or you know, a, versus just the average person going on a little excursion to a volcano. Yeah. I agree with you in that sense, but you know, there are people that know how to handle it and know how to. Yeah. There should be a response, you know, like right. a disaster plan in place that if this happens, what are we going to do? We're going to have people stand by ready to go and get you mm-hmm. or have, or just take helicopters and have hell have, you know, do much smaller groups so that you've got a hell, you know, you've got a way yeah. to get, in, you know, versus these big, large groups of people going out there and have a better plan in place for if it does go off. I mean, what? Yeah. It had like nothing run ready, run, turn around, run. But then you've got medical director Tony Smith, who's continued to defend his decision to direct emergency services away from the island after the eruption and he's so smug about it i want to like punch Punch this this dude in the face i mean honestly claiming there were no signs of life and landing on the island was too risky for emergency personnel he just has like no empathy when he talks about it either it's like oh yeah we'll we'll play some i don't know why you'd be in emergency services rescuing when you have no empathy for very people dying from very fucking weird he's even admitted that they could have gone to the island sooner but insists that they would not have saved any Uh lives even though rescue choppers could have gotten there within 20 minutes. Dude, of the you blast. don't know that. I would be so offended if I were family members who felt like he put, could have possibly saved people in that time. Yeah. For him to just make a statement like that, so rude. Yeah, here's him, him talking about it. Knowing that we know now we could have flown to the island earlier, but had we gone to the island sooner, I'm absolutely medically confident we were not, unfortunately, we were not going to save any more additional people. He also refuses to comment on what would have happened to Stephanie if she hadn't been taken in Jason's helicopter. And Stephanie herself has said she's for she sure that she would have survived. Those helicopter pilots are heroes because that's not their job. They didn't sign up for that and they still chose to put their lives at risk for us. And I could never be more grateful or thankful towards them. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that all of these people that did survive probably wouldn't have without the help of yeah. those guys. Those guys are heroes, man. Yeah. Those guys did more than the Coast Guard Tom, itself. Mark did. and Jason. Yeah. Heroes for sure. Yeah. And yeah. It would have been a even more tragic story. All those people would have died if they didn't go and help yeah. them. Because who knows how long they would have been yeah. on the island for. Mm-hmm. It seems like they're prepared to wait just... Maybe the next day they would have gone air. All of them would have been dead at that yeah, point because no sure. signs of life. There were no signs of life on the island. So they literally made an assumption of based on what they saw that nobody could have survived that. There's no point to go and rescue them. So therefore, we're just going to wait and then go and do a recovery mission for bodies. That's, That's basically wild. what he decided or they decided God. whoever made that decision. Piece of shit. Which is crazy because I mean, clearly there was survivors. There's boats off the coast of it could easily fly a helicopter out there and see, oh, there's people there. There could mm-hmm. be survivors there. But nope, they're like, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll just wait and see what yeah. happens. Let the dust clear and oh, we'll go do the cleanup God. later. So it's just such a tragic story. Well, our hearts truly go out to anyone who survived the White Island eruption and anyone who didn't survive too. are just heartbroken for you. And, you know, we, we are amazed by people that survived this yeah. and have come forward and done interviews and, in public about what they've been through because I think a lot of us maybe wouldn't have heard this story without yeah, exactly. their voices, you know? And it's an important story that I think everybody should hear because yeah, I think I agree. we're all sometimes a little too, you know, caught up in our Trusting. vacation sometimes that we don't really think about the idea that Something there's still potential dangers here. There's still, you know, things can go wrong. Let's just put it that way. I yeah. mean, some of these tour companies that operate are very sketchy, do not follow, you know, the regulations yeah. and rules they need to because it's mm-hmm. about money at the end of the day. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's for some people, the tours is how they make their livelihoods, you know. And so I get I get that aspect of it. But sometimes safety goes, you know, kind of yeah. out the window a lot of times in order to give tourists a good time and, you know, show them something really cool. Mm-hmm. I know when I go on tour, I'm always like I always cross check you know the tour companies always make sure always make sure you're going with tour companies that have good reputations good reviews but even if you did that in this situation it that well you know, in this situ- I'm, it's not like people yeah. on TripAdvisor were writing no no but i'm just saying like in general like look at if you're just going do more on research tours, in do general re- yeah exactly on the place you're going the conditions 
what could possibly happen. Yeah. Do your and that's research, not to yeah. shame people at all that were there. Cause that would have been a decision that any of us would have made. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, someone presents you this yeah. great tour. Oh, this will be so cool. I've done that, something like that so many times. I mean, we've totally done things like Especially that. Especially so. when it's connected to a cruise line. Yeah. I just feel like that brings it on a whole different level because it's like, on a cruise, you don't necessarily, they're not advertising every excursion on earth. Like they have a select that they typically work with mm -hmm. and they promote and you would expect that that would be yeah. like they something that they verify. Yeah. They verify and like, totally. oh, well, it's normal. They have cruises running 24 seven. So like, yeah, it's just, it's not like you just randomly stumbled upon this tour right, and like right. took it. Like this is a very established, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, it adds another level to it in my opinion. It's crazy. I completely agree. Yeah. And I mean, the fact that there is no disclosure on the hazards of going to the island that day is just crazy have to, to me. Make a decision. For you had no clue. Unbelievable. Well, let us know if you guys want to hear more stories like this one because there are many. Oh, there's endless out there. Yeah. And it kind of changes up things a little bit for us, you know. But there is this like criminal aspect to it, you know. Yeah, there's live, there is. There's, you know, it's not necessarily I agree with you. murder per se, but like we're talking about it's still true crime criminal I negligence totally in my opinion too. i mean somebody yeah. fucked up in this situation yeah. and more people died than should have mm -hmm. because somebody made the wrong decision but that is going to be it for our episode today if you guys enjoyed this episode of mile higher podcast please give us a thumbs up if you're on youtube or give us a rating review situation on apple and spotify that really helps our show out especially if you normally just watch on YouTube, it would really help us out if you go and just download the episode on either Spotify or Apple, because it doesn't actually factor into our podcast numbers. Right. And, so and for those really listening, like hundred percent, go watch this on YouTube. Like, yes, mm -hmm. because you this really, you know, if you're just listening to this, it's hard to wrap your head around mm -hmm. just like everything we were just talking about and you know, all the clips and everything really yeah. just, just hammer it home for you as mm -hmm. far as, how crazy this whole event was so we'll see you guys next week but until then always make sure to take your mind oh, a little higher